Today's video is sponsored by Raycon, the company co-founded by Ray J that make these awesome earbuds with amazing sound. When the sun's shining, I love going on long walks in the great outdoors, and while doing so, my pair of Raycons have become an essential partner. Their compact design and comfortable noise isolating fit have made them a necessity for long strolls and hikes, and their clarity and warmth of sound really elevates whatever album I'm listening to. Thanks to their earbud tap functions, I can listen in a way that suits me too. With a simple tap, you can seamlessly toggle between three customizable sound profiles – pure sound, balanced sound and bass sound, and can even switch between noise isolation mode and awareness mode. Raycon offer their wireless earbuds in a range of fun colours and patterns, with a variety of fit options, and no dangling wires or stems. Their wireless earbuds start at half the price of other premium audio brands on the market, and sound just as great, if not better. With 8 hours of playtime, a 32 hour battery life, and seamless Bluetooth pairing, it's no wonder so many celebrities, from Mike Tyson to JR Smith, are singing their praises. So whether you're travelling, commuting or just getting out and about this summer, a pair of Raycon earbuds are a great way to enhance those sunny vibes. Click the link in the description box, or go to buyraycon.com forward slash masquerade to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. With Raycon's 30 day free return policy, you've really got nothing to lose. Help support the channel at buyraycon.com forward slash masquerade. Oak Beach. A quiet and serene stretch of sand just south of Long Island, about an hour's drive east of Manhattan. Home to gated communities made up of the East Coast's most affluent residents. A calm place where the rich flock to escape the hustle and bustle of the big city. An unlikely setting for a murder. It was just before dawn on the morning of May 1st, 2010, when the police received a call from 24-year-old Shannon Gilbert. The call lasted 23 minutes, and consisted of Shannon screaming, These people are trying to kill me, into the receiver. She frantically begged for assistance. The operator could tell from the young woman's voice that she was clearly terrified and in a state of dismay. Shannon was a Craigslist escort who worked out of Manhattan. She had been called to a client's house in the Oak Beach Association the night prior, though evidently. This particular customer wanted more from Shannon than just her body. They wanted her life, too. Shannon was able to escape the residence before placing her call, and even managed to catch the attention of an elderly man who lived on the island as she frantically ran along its desolate shoreline. This gentleman instantly recognised the fear in Shannon's voice and in her eyes, and told her to come inside and wait for help. Though, for whatever reason, Shannon instead ran off and disappeared into the night. A huge search and rescue effort was launched by the Suffolk County Police Department in an attempt to find Shannon, but unfortunately, that summer came and went with no trace of her being uncovered, either alive or dead. But when the officers made a new attempt to locate her in December of that same year, they'd end up finding more than they had bargained for. This is the story of Lisk, the Long Island serial killer. Well aware that most dump bodies are found by roadsides, the man helming the search for Shannon, one officer John Malia, walked his cadaver dog, Blue, along the shoulder of Ocean Parkway. On December 11th, Blue picked up on a scent, and led Officer Malia to a disintegrated burlap sack, the type used for hunting blinds, which was found in the brush, wrapped in loosened duct tape. Inside, Malia discovered a human skeleton. It seemed as if the worst had just been confirmed. But to everyone's surprise, it was quickly determined that the remains didn't belong to Shannon Gilbert, and nor did the three other bodies that they discovered just 500 feet away. Unbeknownst to the local residents, the small, peaceful shoreline that they called home was a veritable graveyard. By mid-April, Detectives have found a total of 10 human bodies scattered across Gilgo Beach and its neighbouring areas. And chillingly, they had all been victims of homicide. The first four bodies, referred to by investigators as the Gilgo Four, were found between December 11th and December 13th, 2010. In the order they were found, 
They were Melissa Barthelemy, a 24-year-old from the Unionport section of the Bronx. She went missing on July 12th, 2009. Melissa had long dreamed of opening up her own hair salon, but at the time of her disappearance, she worked as an escort, one who advertised her services on Craigslist. Beginning just one week after disappearing, Melissa's sister received a string of menacing phone calls from an unknown male, who would ask her things like, Are you a whore like your sister? This male eventually confessed that, quote, Melissa's dead, and I'm gonna watch her rot. These calls were traced to Madison Square Garden, Manhattan, and Massapequa in Nassau County. Maureen Brainard Barnes, a 25-year-old escort and mother of two from Connecticut. Her feet and ankles were found bound up with an old, distinctive belt with the initials HM on the inside. She had last been seen on July 9th, 2007, catching a train from New London to Grand Central Terminal. Just like Melissa, Maureen was known to advertise her services on Craigslist, and had told a close friend that she was actually going to the Big Apple to meet a client. That same friend later received a call from an unknown male who claimed that he had seen Maureen alive and well in Queens, and told said friend not to go looking for her. Megan Waterman, a 22-year-old mother of one who lived in Scarborough, Maine. She went missing on June 6th, 2010 after placing an ad for her services on Craigslist. She told her boyfriend that she was going out and that she'd call him later. She never did. After checking into a hotel just 15 miles from Gilgo Beach, she was never heard from again. Amber Costello, a 27-year-old who lived in West Babylon, just 10 miles north of Gilgo. Amber battled with addiction, and to support her habit, she sold her body on Craigslist. On the evening of September 2nd, 2010, a client had contacted her numerous times and offered her $1,500 for a single night of fun. She had agreed to meet him, and in doing so, met her end. The Gilgo Four were all young, petite women who worked the same job on Craigslist. They had all been strangled. They'd all been found in duct tape wrapped burlap coverings, and according to investigators, they had all met their end at the hands of the same individual. A man they dubbed Lisk. Following the discovery of the Gilgo Four, a further six bodies were uncovered, starting just two miles up the coast. Again, in the order they were found, they were Jessica Taylor, formerly known as Jane Doe No. 5, a 20-year-old Manhattan escort whose head, hands and forearm were found at Gilgo. Her torso had been found atop a pile of scrap wood in Manaville back in 2003. Asian Doe, a yet-to-be-identified John whose remains were found on Gilgo Beach, and who had been dead for the past five to ten years. The COD had likely been bludgeoning. Despite being biologically male, the victim was found wearing women's clothes. Given that they were otherwise the only male victim, the authorities speculate that Asian Doe may have been transgender. Forensic experts believe Asian Doe was somewhere between 17 and 23 years of age. They were missing four teeth, and may have had a musculoskeletal disorder which could have affected their gait. Valerie Mack, formerly known as Jane Doe No. 6, a 24-year-old escort from Philadelphia who had vanished back in 2003, and whose head, hands, and right foot were found near Gilgo. Much like Jessica Taylor, her torso had also been found in Manaville in November 2000. Baby Doe, an unidentified two-year-old, found approximately 250 feet away from Valerie Mack. The remains showed no visible signs of injury. The Doe was determined to be of African-American descent, and had been dressed in gold earrings and a gold necklace. Peaches, a still unidentified Jane Doe, whose head and limbs were found inside a plastic bag near Jones Beach State Park, Nassau County. DNA linked these remains to a torso found in Hempstead Lake State Park 14 years earlier. She was named after the distinctive tattoo on her chest, 
Yet, despite this identifying feature, nobody has ever come forward to ID her. The DNA test also confirmed that Peaches was the mother of Baby Doe. It's speculated that Peaches and Baby Doe may have had a closer, more personal relationship with their killer than any of the other victims. Fire Island Doe An unidentified Jane Her skull and several of her teeth were found at Tabay Beach, Nassau County. These were linked via DNA to a pair of severed legs found on Fire Island back in 1996, chronologically making her both the first and last Doe to be found. These final six victims are often attributed to Lisk, since they were found so close to the Gilgo Four, and since the ones that have been identified also turned out to be corpse workers. However, the method of disposal in these cases doesn't quite match up with the MO employed by Lisk. The Gilgo Four have been discarded in burlap sacks, whereas these other six, with the exception of Baby Doe, have been chopped up, placed into trash bags, and scattered across multiple locations. Not to mention, these slayings seem to predate those of the Gilgo Four by at least a decade. That suggests that Lisk either took a break from his twisted hobby for whatever reason, then later continued his spree with a new MO, or that there were multiple killers operating in the same area. It's speculated that Lisk may have also been responsible for several other slayings in and around Long Island too, including those of Cherries in 2007. Tanya Rush in 2008, and, of course, Shannon Gilbert, whose disappearance sparked the entire Lisk investigation, and whose lifeless body was finally located in a marsh in December 2011. Suffolk police have since concluded that she had drowned accidentally, and despite her call to 911, most people agree that that probably is the case. Even though she worked the same job as the Gilgo Four, and went missing in the same area they had, Shannon also had a history of mental health problems. Psychosis and hallucinations ran in her family. For instance, in 2016, Shannon's own mother, Marie, would end up being killed by another one of her daughters during a psychotic break in which she thought her mum was Lisk. This other daughter, Sarah, punctured Marie hundreds of times with a sharp blade before finally bludgeoning her with a fire extinguisher. Sarah was subsequently sentenced to 25 years to life. It's generally accepted that on the night that she went missing, Shannon was having an episode of her own, that she ran into the overgrown brush to hide from some imagined maleficent force, only to trip into the marsh and drown. Yet, in a bizarre turn of events, Shannon's accidental demise resulted in the discovery of ten people who actually had met their fate at the hands of a monster. One that had just been brought to the world's attention. And yet despite a dozen years of detective work, and hundreds of tips being called in, little progress was made in identifying who Lisk actually was. It was clear to investigators that Lisk was smart, that he was thorough, and evidently, that he was ruthless. After all, strangulation is an intensely personal way to end someone's life, and is typically favoured by killers for one of two reasons. Because they truly hate the person or people they're slaying, or because they cherish the sense of control it gives them. Unsatisfied with the progress of the investigation, Suffolk County District Attorney Raymond Tierney assembled a new task force in January 2022. Their mission? To finally bring Lisk to justice. That spring, they interviewed a key witness in the case, the pimp of Amber Costello. According to this still unnamed witness, on the night of September 1st, 2010, Amber had a client turn up to her apartment for business purposes. This man had contacted Amber through Craigslist, and the pair had agreed a price for the evening. However, the client was completely unaware that he was walking into a trap one laid by Amber herself. After he arrived and entered Amber's apartment, she immediately asked him for payment up front. After receiving the money, a man playing the role of her angry boyfriend burst in through the door and scared the client off, no doubt demanding extra money from him in the process. The following day, that same client contacted Amber again, 
and offered her $1,500 to come over to his house so that they could spend some quality time together. That way, they wouldn't be disturbed by any pesky boyfriends. Amber agreed, and travelled to New York to meet him on September 2nd. And, of course, was never seen again. Not alive, at least. According to the witness, this client was a large, white, ogre-like male in his mid-forties, around six foot four to six foot six inches tall, with dark, bushy hair and big, oval-style 1970s type eyeglasses. Crucially, the witness recalled that the client drove a green, first-generation Chevrolet Avalanche. He'd seen him get into it when he fled Amber's apartment. With that key piece of information, the task force did a registration search and identified all of the green first-gen avalanches in New York and Long Island. They then examined the physical appearance of all of the owners. One stood out. Rex Heuerman, a 59-year-old architect, business owner, and married father of two who lived in Long Island. A behemoth of a man with bushy hair, he seemed to match that ogreish description given by the witness and would have indeed been in his mid-forties when Amber disappeared. Not only that, but Rex worked out of Manhattan, where at least several of the Lisk victims ventured to before their untimely ends. Now obviously owning a green Chevy and being a big guy wasn't enough evidence to bring him in on. So the force did a little more digging. They learned as much about Rex Heuerman as they could while maintaining their distance. It was clear that he was an intelligent man, no doubt about that, the guy had made a success of himself in the Big Apple, had started his own company, RH Consultants, and had an office near the Empire State Building, netting contracts worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. But in spite of his accomplishments, there was an undeniable darkness about the man. From what they could gather, Rex seemed to be obsessed with his position of authority. His workforce, which mainly consisted of young, attractive women, all later described him as arrogant and creepy with some even mentioning that he would leave them unsettling and inappropriate voicemails and love letters. His neighbours would later speak about how he would glare at them angrily while chopping wood in his garden, and how, despite living in a tight-knit community, all of the local parents warned their children to stay away from the Heuerman household. Last month, the task force began to fear that Heuerman may be onto them. They knew that he had been obsessively keeping an eye on their progress via internet searches, and worried that he may flee the country or prepare for a final stand, they decided to act. But before they did, they needed to obtain one final piece of evidence to confirm that Heuerman was Lisk. And so it was that Rex Heuerman was brought down by, of all things, a pizza crust. You see, in the bottom of the burlap sack that Megan Waterman was found wrapped in, forensic investigators have found a single human hair one that didn't belong to Megan. If the task force could match Heuerman's DNA to that hair, they'd have enough evidence to charge him. And so, a surveillance team sat outside Heuerman's Manhattan workplace and waited for an opportunity to nab a sample of his DNA. And that chance came just last month, when Heuerman ordered a pizza to his office and discarded the box in the trash can outside. The team covertly snatched the box, and to their delight, found that Heuerman's appetite had betrayed him. Inside, he had left a single, uneaten pizza crust. The crust and a napkin were swabbed and analysed, and on June 12th, the results came in. The DNA from the crust and the hair found in the burlap sack were a 99.96% match. Jackpot. On July 13th, Heuerman was surrounded by detectives and taken into custody as he exited his Manhattan office. He was charged with taking the lives of Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Lynn Costello, and is strongly suspected of taking the life of Maureen Brainard Barnes. The Gilgo 4. Though nothing has been announced as of yet, Heuerman remains the prime suspect in the six other unsolved homicides around Gilgo, too. Now it's important to note that this case is still ongoing, and everyone's considered innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. 
it's also important to note that Hewerman maintains his innocence, and says that he wasn't involved in any of the slayings. With that said, I'll now go over all of the evidence that the authorities currently have against Hewerman. Evidence that amounts to terabytes of documents, videos, and reports. The first, and perhaps most significant piece of evidence against him, revolves around phone data. Investigators were able to obtain the records for a set of burner phones used to contact and meet up with the Gilgo 4 just before their untimely ends. What's interesting is that whenever these burner phones pinged off a cell tower, as they had in Madison Square Garden and Massapequa, Hewerman's own personal mobile phone pinged off the same towers at the exact same times. This didn't just happen once or twice. His personal phone seemed to be in the exact same location as each burner phone whenever they were active. But let's say that, hypothetically, the real killer just so happened to be sticking to Hewerman's side like glue whenever he used one of these burner phones. Well, Hewerman's personal phone and the burner phones just so happened to ping off the exact same towers as his four victims' phones on the evenings that they went missing. That means that at the time that each respective woman disappeared, his devices and theirs were in sync and travelling together. Surveillance footage from an electronics store near his office even shows him purchasing one of the burners. All of these burner calls and messages have been placed from within a quarter mile radius of Hewerman's office during his lunch breaks and after work hours. And if all of that wasn't enough to convince you that the burners belong to Hewerman, then this should. Using a fake profile, Hewerman made use of Tinder to contact numerous women in the Manhattan area. He had registered an account under the name Andrew Roberts using one of his personal email addresses. Through that profile, he would send selfies of himself to his matches. Selfies taken and sent from the same burner phones used to contact the Gilgo 4. It's funny, Hewerman was clearly a smart guy capable of establishing his own architecture company, but at the same time, didn't realise that he shouldn't send selfies from anonymous burner devices. The mind boggles. The second key piece of evidence against Rex Hewerman is the aforementioned DNA. As we've covered, a single hair found on Megan Waterman's body was analysed, and forensic experts can say with a 99.96% degree of accuracy that it belonged to Rex Hewerman. Now we could brush that off as a massive coincidence. After all, there is a 0.04% degree of error. It's also possible that he and Megan simply bumped into each other on the day of the slaying. Highly unlikely, but possible I suppose. But if that's the case, then answer this. Why was his wife's hair found on three of the bodies? That's right, hair from Rex Hewerman's wife was found on the remains of Melissa Barthelemy, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. To be clear, that's not to accuse his wife of being involved in any way. Mrs Hewerman was either out of state or overseas when each of the slayings occurred, and this massive break in the list case has come as a complete surprise to her. One that's turned her world upside down, since she's already filed for divorce. But the presence of her hair on three of the victims strengthens the prosecutor's case against her husband, as it strongly implies one of two things. That Rex either left his wife's hair behind intentionally as a calling card, or that her hairs simply fell off his clothes as he was living out his twisted fantasies. Every couple living together knows how often their partner's hair turns up all over the place, especially on their clothes. The third damning piece of evidence against Rex Hewerman is his past search history. Data obtained from Hewerman's PC shows that in the 14 months before his arrest, he had made 200 separate searches on the internet related to the Lisk investigation. These searches included things like, why hasn't the Long Island serial killer been caught? And why could law enforcement not trace the calls made by Lisk? Hewerman read up about specific officers working his case, and often listened to podcasts and watched documentaries and YouTube videos covering Lisk. He also compulsively searched for information about the victims, and had clearly been trying to locate and contact their family members. On top of that, Investigators found hundreds of searches for content that's just too deranged to go into detail about here, many of them involving and 
though he's only on the hook for four of the slayings at this present moment. It's worth noting that Hewerman had also searched the term Asian male twink. This was the only anomaly that didn't match the typical pattern of searches made by Hewerman, and given that the remains of a biologically male Asian doe were found close to the Gilgo 4, well, in the minds of many, that's no coincidence. I have one tool that's pretty much used in almost every job, and it's actually a cabinet maker's hammer. Oh, okay, Kevin, let's make a hammer. Okay. It is persuasive enough <laughs> when I need to persuade something. Not someone. Something. <laughs> and it always yields excellent results. One final tidbit that I think's worth adding revolves around the belt that was used to bind marine brained bombs. Remember how I mentioned that it featured the initials HM? Well, Investigators now believe that it should have been read the other way around. W. H. The initials of Rex Hewerman's grandfather, William. In the words of D.A. Ratieni, assign to that what you will. Since his arrest, law enforcement have done a thorough search of Hewerman's entire Long Island residence. In the basement, they found a completely soundproof chamber in which they assert that at least one of the victims was slain. This alleged killing room was essentially a vault, with a heavy duty safe door and concrete walls two to three feet thick. Officers have also reportedly seized several items of interest from the house, including a life-sized doll of a child encased in glass, a large portrait of a disfigured woman, and more than 200 firearms, which Hewerman kept for hunting purposes. Unfortunately, the human family property has since turned into something of a morbid tourist attraction, with hundreds of people descending on the household to take photos and ask questions, turning the lives of Mrs. Hewerman and her two adult children into, quote, a surreal waking horror show. They're still coming to terms with their husband and father's deranged double life. On the surface, he was a successful multimillionaire family man who lived the sort of life that most people strive for. But underneath his professional exterior, the evidence suggests that he was a cold and calculating killer. One who could take lives and then go back to work the next day as if things were business as usual. A man who habitually visited sex workers and had done so hundreds of times both before, during, and after the Liss Grampage. Right up until the end in fact, he had been contacting them and planning meetups. Which begs the question, if he visited so many of these workers during his adult life, then why did he choose to end the lives of these workers in particular? Given that they were all short and slender, it may be that they just so happened to match his type. That being said, it could also be that these workers are the ones who deceived him in some way, much as Amber had when she had laid her extortion trap. As we speak, the investigators continue to search for any more remains that may be laying undiscovered in and around Gilgo. So far, no more have turned up, suggesting that once the Gilgo 4 were uncovered, Lisk gave up his dark hobby entirely. It's often assumed that serial slayers lack any type of self-control and can never truly give up on their twisted ways, but in reality, that's not the case. It seems that Rex had enough self-control to time his slayings for when his wife was out of town, so he likely had enough to stop completely when his activities came to light. But even though he evaded capture for so long, he couldn't outrun his past forever. And in the end, he was brought down by a combination of his own hubris, and also by pure chance. The fact that the unrelated search for Shannon Gilbert led to the capture of Rex Hewerman almost feels like some sort of cosmic justice. Had Shannon not been called to Oak Beach that night, had she not had her episode and disappeared, then who knows how long it would have taken to bring Lisk to the world's attention. As for the Lisk victims, I'm glad that at least four of them are receiving some sort of justice, though it's still unclear whether Rex will face any further charges related to the six earlier slayings. With that being said, let me end by telling you about the most recent update, one related to Fire Island Jane Doe, whose remains were both the first and last to be uncovered, her legs back in 96 and her skull and teeth in 2010. 
For more than 26 years, her identity has remained a mystery. That is, until just last week, when she was finally identified as Karen Vergata, a 34-year-old escort from Manhattan who vanished on Valentine's Day 1996. She wasn't reported missing at the time, but has finally been given back her name thanks to genealogical research conducted by the FBI. Though the authorities haven't yet confirmed whether her case is also linked to Hewerman, I'll just say that the timing seems pertinent. But until it's confirmed whether Lisk was involved in her slaying, or indeed in those of the other five, then there'll always be that second theory floating around. That another monster just so happened to be prowling the same turf one decade prior. One whose existence we're still unaware of. One who's yet to be given a name. One who's still out there, living his life, just as Rex Hewerman had for so many years. His colleagues, neighbours, and family completely unaware of his dark secret. I'll leave any updates about this case on my Twitter page. Link in the description. A huge shout out to my supporters here on YouTube and over on Patreon. Especially my biggest supporters. Matt Fennell, George Lopez, Holly Lyons, Alex Greensall, Asia Mina, Azrael Warakai, Brad Hammer 33, Chief Kochuake, Colin Monsma, Connor Lothan, Dupsy, Gina Valera, Ian Billock, Infamous Sempapi, Monica Mendoza, Peter Logdredge, Taylor and Monica Gruink, TNS Mum, Dustin and Tiffany Vanderpool, Ellen Doloff, Itai Allen, Nefus1988, Lydia Cumo, and Hamish K. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. Until next time, remember, the devil's in the detail.